You are good. I can see that from my picture on the screen that my intention to trim my beard last night, it got ignored. So if I look scruffy to you, it's an accurate view. And uh, <laughs> uh, I'll try to do better for next week. It's uh, a matter of remembering to find the right scissors and to lean over the sink and to otherwise to take a dramatic events <laughs> in order to trim my beard. Well, let's open with prayer, shall we? Gracious God, we thank you. We thank you for this technology that allows us to get together around your word. And we thank you for your word and the wonderful truths that we discover in it. And we thank you for Pastor Mark and our brothers and sisters in the two congregations. Bless us to your purposes, Lord, we say in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And good morning, all. We're looking at Isaiah. And Isaiah is a long book with many interesting sections and prophecies and predictions and uh, interjected little comments about proper behavior. And it's a lot more complicated than I thought it would be, as I said last time. And so you'll have to bear with me. I hope you will uh, interject if you have questions. We have Pastor Mark available and fully prepared. He's a seminary graduate. He knows the stuff. And so if you've got a question, he can answer it. And if you've got a comment or a thought or a way to extend the reading, please add it in. We're, uh, think of us as a small group, as a small group Bible studies uh, many of us grew up with. Did you have a small group Bible study at one point or another? I know in college, we had a little group uh, that met under the auspices of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. And there was another small group we would tease because they were under the auspices of Campus Crusade. And we would say to them, ah, ours is better. And they would say, no, ah, ours is better. It was lots of fun. And both Bonnie and I were in Christian houses in college. And so we had Bible studies there and fellowship and devotion times there. It was all a part of uh, what is now a few years ago in our youth. Okay, we're talking about Isaiah. It's long. It has several major different sections. Today we begin uh, after. Think of the chapter one that we looked at as the introduction. Now we begin section one. And it's full of prophecies and predictions. It's full of various editorial comments. Uh, it doesn't ever say don't mute the pastor. But if, if there had been the option, it would have said that. It's a, all kinds of different things for us to think about. And as we look at it in chapter two, uh, we're going to find the beginning of a lot of information about Jerusalem and Judah. And in some way, we're in Isaiah. Isaiah is maybe... 700 years before Jesus, something like that, 600, 700. And it is a, a time of some complexities. Isaiah, as he's looking around, sees the Assyrians gathering up north and looking like they're going to invade. Entirely possible that they will lose the whole country. In fact, they lost a lot, but they kept Jerusalem. And so in many ways, this whole book is a hymn to Jerusalem. Let's put it that way, all right? 
So let me read the first five verses that we're going to talk about. Isaiah chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. The word of which Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. We're talking about Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion, or Jerusalem, shall come forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He, Jehovah, shall judge between the nations and shall decide for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Come, O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. I really like that last verse. is a way to bring ourselves together. Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. It is 2,700 years ago, and we're in exactly the same place. When we say our money, morning prayers, we can say, come, Lord, let us walk in your light. God's light and God's truth and God's presence is available to us. The same light and the same truth and the same presence that was available to Isaiah. So he is singing a hymn for me here, and I'm going to claim it and hold really tight to it. The word of the Lord, the word of Isaiah concerning Judah and Jerusalem. The, this is the beginning now of the first of three major sections that occur in the first 12 chapters. We're gonna regard, somebody has their sound on, I mean, the broadcast on as well as the sound. So we're getting lots of interesting reverberations. I guess reverberations are okay. So it shall came, come to pass in the latter days. The latter days is a phrase that's used several times in the Old Testament where it seems to mean in a little bit, in the future. At some time, we're not exactly sure. But when we get to the New Testament, the phrase takes on the additional meaning of saying uh, at the end times when the Lord returns. So in this case, latter days means it's going to come to pass. God says, you can be comfortable with it. I just don't know whether it's next Tuesday or five years from now, okay? It shall come to pass in the latter days, eventually. But I don't know when exactly, Isaiah says. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest mountains. Uh, the temple itself was not on a high mountain compared to the other mountains around. So think of this as a poem or think of it as a hymn. We're going to be singing, saying this poem or studying this poem or thinking ourselves of this as a hymn as we go along that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. 
And many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of Jacob. Why? And this is where we can claim it. Why? Why? That he may teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. We want to learn the ways of God, don't we? We want to be able to go through the day walking in God's presence. This is our goal. This is our hope. This is our expectation that what I do today is walk in God's ways. For out of Jerusalem shall come forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And then the great cry of hope. He shall judge between the nations and he shall decide for many peoples and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks and nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. This is a great prophecy of hope and a hope that is going to recur in the book. Isaiah is known as the writer of doom. <laughs> that many of the things that Isaiah says are along, are along the line is, don't fret, the alligators will get you eventually. <laughs> Bad things are going to happen. The Chaldeans are lurking up north and I'm getting older and decrepit and my knees hurt. So all of these things are true about this, but he embeds these great hymns or poems of hope, prophecies of hope in chapter four, in chapter nine, and in chapter 11. In chapter four, in that day, the branch of the Lord should be beautiful and glorious. In chapter nine, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And in chapter 11, they shall come, there shall come from uh, the stump of Jesse a shoot. That is the kind of prophecy that informed a lot of the church in that day, but really is pervasive in the New Testament. And there are New Testament writings that link specifically to this and equivalent passages in Amos and in Micah. So your homework for this week is to spend a, a few moments reading through Amos and a few moments reading through Micah to get the reverberations. They're both very short. It won't take you very long. Okay? But here we go. Isaiah is then transformed from an 8th century prophet of doom to a prophet of hope. And so much of the early Christian thinking and writing about salvation touches into what the what Micah has to say, what Isaiah has to say. So it says here, the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, in which the prophet saw, highlights the term word of the Lord. And this is a phrase that is used in other books, again in Habakkuk and in Micah, and particular pay, attention is paid to Jerusalem and to Jerusalem as the faithful city. This is one of the most beautiful passages in the Old Testament. And because of Jerusalem and because of what we find in Jerusalem, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks a nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Pacifist groups over the years have really hung on to this. It's going to be possible. 
peace is possible. Freedom from war is possible. God promised. Now we haven't got there yet. So you're going to have to be patient and drink your coffee and just pray, God, may this happen soon. Now, the house of the Lord he talked about is the temple in Jerusalem. Originally, the temple was built by Solomon and, and destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and rebuilt in the days of Zechariah and then destroyed by the Romans. So it's, there are lots of feelings of the opposition to God when you think about the ruin, temple in ruins and the hope that God promises when we talk about it being rebuilt and there. Uh, the notion of the mountain being high and the temple being lifted up brings us to mind, remember in the Gospel of John, as no, Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Why? That whoever believes in him might have eternal life. The notion of the lifting up is the common theme here. Now, as we look at all of this and think about all of this, the word of the Lord and the word of the law aren't identified anymore precisely but they do evoke for us the notion that God's got things in hand. He promised, he repeated his promises, and now he, Isaiah is saying, it's gonna be okay. God's got it in hand. Now, when the alligator is chewing on your foot, it's hard to say, God's got everything in hand. <laughs> but that's the invitation. That's what our focus is supposed to be. Now, the next section of chapter two, the, the rest of the chapter two, is a complicated general statement that talks about God's irritation with his people for a whole variety of reasons. And we'll, I'm gonna read through this and talk about it as we go. He says of God, for you have rejected thy people, the house of Jacob. God has rejected them. Their bad things have happened and will happen. Why? Because they are full of diviners from the east and soothsayers like the Philistines, and they strike hands with foreigners. And their land is filled with silver and gold, and there's no end to their treasures. Their land is filled with horses, and there is no end to their chariots. Their land is filled with idols, and they bow down to the work of hands, to what their own fingers have made. Several different things here. Diviners from the East and soothsayers from the Philistines. That is, there are people, the people of Israel are listening to the cant from foreigners and other religions. If you think about how hard it would be to invite uh, a stranger of a different religion in your house to live with you for a while, and you're trying to remain true to your faith. When the phrase then is they strike hands with foreigners is an odd expression in Hebrew and it's translated several different ways in the different Bibles. And 
It, here it's they strike hands with foreigners. It's like they're shaking hands and making deals. But it, it can also be translated differently. Um, and the children of foreigners are everywhere. I don't know Hebrew. I don't know how one phrase can mean those two very different things. But the general notion is there's an intrusion in the people of other thoughts and other ideas. They're making deals with foreigners or they're inviting their families and their children in. We don't know. It could be all of that. So their land now, the land of uh, uh, Jerusalem and its surroundings is wealthy. There's no end to their treasures. They're filled the land with idols. Things are going very well. They worship what they have earned and what they have saved. If you think of a person who has a giant uh, bank account, who doesn't need to go to church, he's got a lot of money. There was a news report of a man who had just, uh, the man who bought Twitter for oh, yeah. $6 billion, some number. And that seemed like such a large number, but he still has $100 billion in his savings account. I can't even imagine that. What is it like to have $100 billion? You can buy a lot of chocolate bars. <laughs> <laughs> I could even go buy a new car. Ours is only seven years old. I could get it for $100 billion. I could buy a dozen cars and not even notice it. And he said, that's the sort of thinking that gets you in trouble because your attention is drawn from God to the stuff, right? From God to the things, to your apparent ability to control, your apparent ability to regulate everything that needs to be regulated that ability to control them. Can lead us apparent, I should say apparent, the apparent ability to control. And the fact that you have a, a money in the bank doesn't mean that you're home free. It says here, your land is filled with idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, so to what their own fingers have made. So man is humble, and men are brought low. Forgive them not. Don't let them get away with this. The fact, or at least don't let yourself get away with this. Try to look then at what is distracting you. Look at what it is that is interrupting your worship or calling your attention away from the worship and calling your attention away from scripture. I don't watch daytime television hardly at all. And I particularly got tired very early of game shows. Maybe you like game shows, you know. What is the population of Memphis, they ask, and somebody probably knows. That's a distraction, right? And what he's saying is don't allow yourself to be distracted. The price of right, the price is right, is not a good substitute for rereading the scriptures. So here we go. Then enter into the rock and hide in the dust from before the terror of the Lord, from the glory of his majesty. So God is all powerful. And as you stumble into his presence, you fall to your face 
because you're terrified because of his power and because of his holiness. And you say, God, forgive me because I'm a sinner and I've wandered from your leading. But this is what's going to be happening. You are, rather than being distracted, you are called to enter into the rock. <laughs> and the commentator went on at some length saying, I'm not entirely sure what that means. All right. It seems to me, if there's a great stone, it's there, it's permanent. You can put your hands on it. It's not going to, away, uh, to disappear or fade. Right? We've got rocks around our garden and this interminable rain. It's not actually raining today yet. Isn't that nice? It, they are going to make the rocks go away. The rocks are dependable. So when he says, enter into the stone, enter into the rock, I think what it means, I think, Pastor Mark can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what it means is find that which is true and stable and ever and everlasting. The word of God, the presence of God, the son of God, he is the rock and the source of our salvation. Mark, I, would, I, would, I would agree in what the <clears throat> theologian Tillich had said was, is that his definition of God was the ground of our being. Ah. That which we stand on. And then I think if you go forward, why Peter was named, you know, he gets his name gets changed to Petra, <laughs> the rock and on the rock. that. No. Okay. Yeah, that, that the church is built. That is, that is. And then I think about, you know, Moses hiding in the cleft of the rock. I think of yeah. various places when the rock was struck, water came forth with, you know, again with Moses. But yeah, rock, very, very, it's everything. <laughs> okay. A wonderful combination of images. So enter the rock from before, uh, hide there from before the terror of the glory of the Lord and from the glory of his majesty. So God is glorious and it doesn't make us jump with joy. It makes us say, oh my goodness gracious, I didn't understand. Oh my goodness gracious, I so underestimated him. Oh my goodness gracious, I should have paid more attention. Okay. For the haughty looks of men shall be brought low, and the pride of men shall be humble, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. So come the day of judgment, or come the day that the Lord returns, or come the day that you are ushered by angels with flaming swords into his presence. Come that day. Right? He is holy and alone to be exalted. The great head of the angels is wondrous and has powers and is beautiful, but is nothing compared to God. Okay? So we have to keep that in mind. In verse 12 then, for the Lord of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up on high. And then he has a long list of wonderful, powerful things. And but notice the overall idea as we lead to this list. However great and powerful it is, the Lord of hosts is lifted up, proud and lofty against all of those things. There was a news thing from... Uh, the wars in the Near East, and they were showing the 
new American tank coming down the road, powerful with a great gun in the front and machine guns on either side and powerful, able to run over everything. However exalted the tank is, God has more power. God has more presence. And so what he is saying here, the Lord of hosts, as a day that is proud and lofty against all that is lifted up high. <laughs> and then think for a little bit about all of these things that are wonderful that God is greater than. Against all the cedars of Lebanon, lofty and lifted up. Against all the oaks of nation, against all the high mountains, against all the lofty hills, against every high tower, against every fortified wall, against all the ships of Tarshish, and all the beautiful craft, and the so in all of these wonderful things, God is greater. God will stand. I was thinking about this, I, I think I mentioned last week, sitting on our back deck to get a good view of Mount Hood, standing proud and now covered with snow. Such a big mountain compared to me, and that is minuscule compared to God. And I kept trying to make that work in my head, and I haven't quite got that yet, to think of God. Think of God, my youth in an evangelical church was that we thought of God, Jesus as the kindly soul walking next to you, his hand gently on your shoulder, keeping you from harm and healing you. In the other image, equally true, is God is the great power, greater than the mountain, greater than the redwoods, greater than the walls around the city. Against all of this, and then against the haughtiness of man, the pride of men. You hear that sometimes in the politicians who are saying things like, yeah, 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 our army is bigger than your army. <laughs> our guns are more powerful than your guns. Look, all the guns we have, how large our Navy is, the power of our Air Force. There was a thing on the news of one of the new jet fighters, and I don't remember the number, I'm sorry, but it was faster and it was more maneuverable and it had more cannons on it, and it was powerful, and it's really special. Boy, you can't mess with us, because you say in your pride, we got the best jet fighters. What does Isaiah say? Not knowing about jet fighters yet, the haughtiness of men shall be humbled, and the pride of men shall be brought low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in the day that he chooses to express himself in the day of the Lord. All will be humbled. All will be humbled, however proud they are, however big their aircraft carrier is, <laughs> however rich their oil deals are however strong they are as an individual and however much weight they can lift or however fluent they are, it's the Lord who will stand. I can hang on to our, my Lord Jesus. And he goes on to say, and the idols shall utterly pass away. And men are going to flee. They're going to enter into caves and holes in the ground because in terror of the Lord and from his glory, 
as he rises to terrify the earth. This man who was proud of his wealth and has wonderful idols made of solid, I'm, I'm making this up, it's not in the text. No. He's got this six foot high solid gold idol that he worships, rubies for eyes and jewels on his cloak. This beautiful, beautiful idol and they're gonna run away and they're gonna hide in caves and they're gonna grovel in the dust because God is so great. So the balance here is thinking of the love of God and his mercy and his power and his holiness. Can you hold both of those in your head? That's your practice assignment to simultaneously think God is merciful and loving and he wants me to be his son and he wants several of you to be his daughters and he wants you cuddled up closely next to him for safety and love and affection as a part of the family and he can blow the whole lot of us up with the gesture of his wrist, right? Love, mercy, power, holiness. Holiness he is so righteous. He is so perfect and so complete that he, we set him apart. And we talk about holiness, the setting God apart and setting his works apart setting his word apart. We talk about the Holy Bible, don't we? What does that mean? It means it's the word of God and it's special. And we're supposed to pay attention. <laughs> That's why we're looking at Isaiah. Even 2,700 years ago, Isaiah understood that. Because we're going to end up running away and hiding in caves because God is very scary. In that day, in the verse 20 now, if you're following along, in that day, men will cast forth their idols of silver and their idols of gold. Seeing God and knowing him means I take that six foot high statue in gold of, that is my idol, I think that would be probably pretty heavy. So I'm casting, isn't going to be quite right. So I'm gonna go with a little idol here. So I can throw it off the deck and say, no. I can throw it in the ocean and say, no. I can take it down to the D river, throw it in and say, no, that's an idol. That's not God. However much, worth it would be if I were to take it down to sell. He made those idols for themselves to worship. And now they're going to realize they're going to hide with the moles and the bats. Oh, I love that phrase. All right. Two animals that you have the same sort of feeling about. I have a feeling about the mole in my front yard, right? I have a feeling about him. He's not an attractive animal. He's not pleasant. I'm not going to make a bat. And the same of bats. Have you ever looked carefully at a bat? They are not beautiful animals. One of the nature programs had pure white bats the other night, and they were actually kind of spectacular and beautiful. But generally, moles and bats are not the sorts of things that we like to invite into the party. So we run in terror from the Lord and from the glory of his majesty, and we turn away. We turn away from all of those experts who tell us how to live. 
and we turn away from all the investment consultants, and we turn away from the wise men who present themselves on the internet. We turn away from man in whose nostrils is breath, for of what account is he? I, that's a funny phrase, isn't it? To re, re show that the limitations and the mm, humanity of these people that we could be listening to, in whose nostrils is breath. We're not talking about God, who's beyond all this. We're talking about the chap down the street who wants my next car not to be a Honda, but a Subaru. And he's got all kind of good reasons to explain this to me. And we have people who are eager to tell me why I shouldn't be reading the NASB, but I should be reading the King James. And they've got lots of good. These are people, they understand some things, but they don't understand at all. Then they aren't in a position really to speak for God. He's got lots of things that he is say, going to say about people. The commentator says, in a pathetic act of repentance, too late to protect them from the terror of the Lord, they throw out their idols and they run away and they say, oh, forgive me. I'm not going to trust in man anymore, but they have lived in arrogance and materialism and secularism and in the words of their own understanding. And if their understanding meant, said to them, you should be a communist or you can be an adulterer or any of these things, we listen to that and we don't listen to the Lord. And that's the pathetic thing. That's the thing that hurts. Now, the chapter break isn't a, a change, it's an extension. So I'm going to talk just about two verses of chapter three. For four, he says, listen, because of all of what I've said, four, because Behold, all right, that's an emphasis, isn't it? Pay attention. Did you ever speak that way to your children? I, Listen to me, <laughs> right? Behold, pay attention. For, he says, behold, the Lord of hosts is taking away from Jerusalem and from, from Judah, stay and staff the whole stay of bread, the whole stay of water. We're thinking probably the word stay is, means uh, like a cane or something that you use to support yourself. The stay of bread is that basic resource of bread, of food that keeps you going, right? The stay of uh, uh, water is the, that which you need to drink, or in my case, a fresh pot of coffee to keep me going for the day. God is taking that away because you haven't been paying attention. You weren't paying attention. You weren't doing the thing you were supposed to do. You weren't regarding him as holy. You weren't regarding him as someone who has expectations of you. And this goes back to what we talked about before. God has expectations for Philip today. God has expectation. These are the things that I expect of you. These are the things I expect you to think. 
And these are the things I expect you to read. And these are the things that I expect you to do. This is what I expect of you. God has a plan for my life. It takes me back to college and uh, campus crusade. God has a plan for your life. And it's easy to make it too big a deal. So one of the reasons, the ways to make it real is to say, God has a plan for your morning. God has a plan for your 11 o'clock hour after the Bible study. God has a plan for you. And what is it going to be? What has God planned for you? To write to your kids? To reread the passage? To get your filing cabinet in order? To feed the cats? I don't know what God's plan is for you, but he's got one. I guess you could call up Pastor Mark and give him a set of instructions. This is God's plan for you today. You are to bring me cookies or something. But in the interval, we keep in mind for ourselves, God has a plan for me for today, this morning, and this afternoon, and this evening. Not just to fill my time, but to do his work. And sometimes his work is a huge, time-consuming, expensive and energy and money work. And sometimes it's a small thing that you do graciously in showing love. Bonnie came back from grocery shopping this morning to mention that the woman who was chucking out didn't have uh, the right sack. And she was able to allow the lady to reach into her big bag of bags and pick out a sack. What a gracious, godly thing that was. It's exactly what's being written about here, right? To do the thing that God would like you to do right at the moment, which reflects him and his love and his mercy and his care. And so in this section then, he, for those who won't do that, he takes away the stay and the staff, the stay of bread and the stay of water. God holds us accountable. And that's, a, that's the powerful thing. God holds us accountable for doing the things that he wants us to do today. God holds us accountable. He is saying to me, Philip, these are the three things I want you to accomplish. And he may not, in fact, make it easy for me. But these are the three things that he wants done today. So Isaiah has a real sense of God being active in the world and God being active in people's lives. And a real sense that it's up to the people to be aware of him. And a real sense that it's up to the people to understand his majesty, majesty and his expectation and for them to work at that, it isn't just in a single insight, it's a continuing prayer. 
It's a continuing prayer as you pray, God, let me understand this. What do you want from me at 11? God, help me to do that effectively. God, give me wisdom. Lord Jesus and Holy Spirit, fulfill me with the power and the understanding and the wisdom to do what you want from me today. So we go back and keep in mind, this is 2,700 years ago. It's a long time ago, and the world was different. And we're no longer riding camels. And we're no longer uh, only able to communicate by writing something on a piece of parchment. And we're no longer limited to just to people in the immediate vicinity. We have all the luxury of the internet and the television and the like so that we can back up and learn from what somebody, a pastor taught 75 years ago by looking up that sermon on the internet. We have wonderful options. But remember then, as the final point, that God, who is above all and knows all of this, has something for you to do today. Boy, have I got a plan for your life, he says. And that's a good place to stop. Pastor Mark, would you close us in prayer? Would you turn the sound on? <laughs> okay, now you can hear me. There you now go. we can hear you. <laughs> I'm sure that people will have questions, but I think what I would rather have us do would be if you can hold some of those questions for next week when we start, and we can do that, or you can always, um, well, that's where I would put it. <laughs> and if people have questions or more, we can talk about that. So, Phil, thank you for taking us through this. And there are lots of lots of points, but how to take what Isaiah is taking at that time and talking to the people that have the people of Abraham, the people that have been following, hopefully, in, in the way of God have kept up many things. And they struggle just like we struggle in that balance of are we led by God's fear of what the retribution could be for not living up to God's love? Or is it possible that we could be led by the hope of what we gain by being and walking in the way of God? And so I would entertain this prayer. So God, be with us as we walk with you this day. Help us to turn those instruments of war into instruments of peace, of your shalom, to make whole those places that are broken. Help us this day to live in your way, in the way of Jesus Christ. I thank you for all of those that are here this day in, in this Bible study. Bring us together next week as we continue to journey in our understanding of this precious word from you, God. So, all God's children say, Amen. 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 Have a great week, guys. And I'll see you next week. Very good. Thank you all. We'll see you next week.